hope and guidance. Most importantly, we ask that you guide the heart and mind of our dear friend Kirsten, who leads tonight's session with a beautiful topic, a beautiful chapter of an amazing book by John De Angelis. May your guidance be with us now and ever, and so be it. So good evening, everyone, again, and we would like to um, introduce this beautiful Saturday that um, of spring, a little bit cold still, but hopefully getting warm soon, and it will be warmer as Kirsten present to us chapter 10 of the second part of the book entitled Times of Health and Conscientiousness, and today she will be talking to us um, about reincarnation and conscientiousness. Interesting enough, we had this beautiful message by Joanna DeAngelis, right? Reminding us about the future, right? Of the continuation of life. But with no further ado, thank you, Kirsten, for your hard work um, and the little one that is accompanying you as well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll give you the space for you to go ahead and uh, lead the way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leo, and good evening, everyone. Just wanted to double check. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. All right. Well, here we are again meeting on another Saturday, uh, this blessed Saturday, to discuss this book, this chapter. Now, thank you for those who are there physically in person um, and for those who are watching virtually. If you are tuning in at a later recorded version of this, I will say that the last time uh, we met within this series of doing the study of this book, the last chapter, chapter nine of part two, was actually on death. So how fitting that the subsequent chapter, the chapter we're going to be talking about today, is entitled Reincarnation and Conscientiousness. It seems to fit right? Because we think about death, inevitably, we think about reincarnation. Now today, this topic and the frame and the lens that we're going to be looking at through, looking at it through, is not going to be talking about reincarnation on whether or not it exists, although we will mention some statistics, some science, some research that's out there some data, some statistics, right? And some famous researchers that have been researching reincarnation for quite a number of decades. But that being said, this topic that we're discussing today, we're discussing it from the lens of spiritism with the understanding and the belief that we believe that reincarnation is a real thing. And we're not here to debate whether or not, you know, there are various different religious beliefs and creeds that are out there. Some believe, some don't. Reincarnation has, is, has been an, an idea that has existed for the longest time in recorded history, as far back as we can go in history. It, it, it dates back a long, long time, to say the least. But today we are here to talk about reincarnation as a tool for our own happiness and our own betterment. Now, again, we're going to be bringing, excuse me for the noise, going to be bringing some very basic understanding of what reincarnation is. Undoubtedly, there are a lot of jokes out there and a lot of memes, especially I wouldn't say this is a, a term that's so popular as it used to be, but YOLO, which is an acronym for you only live once. And I saw a similar meme as you're looking here on the screen that said something to the effect of, well, I probably shouldn't put um, YOLO on my epitaph, but I should probably put BRB, be right back. Because that would be the truth, really. But we, as a basic understanding, not wanting to go into the various uh, different belief systems and which different creeds and how they view reincarnation, but generally speaking, we understand that reincarnation is, is the rebirth of a soul into a new body. 
right? Basic. And there is research that's out there. Um, this specific research, Pew, the Pew Research Center, I believe this is in 2021, they specifically wanted just to look at the, uh, in the United States, who believes in reincarnation? This is the, the, the last or the latest data, which is only about three years old, give or take, which is not too bad, on who believes in reincarnation. And sharing this, the Pew Research Center shared with us that nearly four in 10 in adults under the age of 50 or 38% believe in reincarnation compared with 27% of those ages 50 and over. And they share a little anecdote, uh, not anecdote, but they share some additional information. You can go and look up this particular um, publication. I believe I shared, nope, I didn't share the link, but I do have it for those who are interested. Where they share overall Catholics are more likely than Protestants to say that they believe reincarnation, 38 versus 26%. But there's a wide variance within these groups. So there's a lot of variance across the board from Hinduism to Buddhism to Spiritism to a lot of other belief systems that are out there. But generally speaking, there is a good amount, at least enough where we know, at least here in the United States, to talk about spirituality, the occult. It definitely is a big business. Why? Because people are curious. And most of us are familiar with this famous researcher, Dr. Ian Stevenson. He is Canadian. He was Canadian born, but he lived here in the U.S. for a number of decades until his death. And in, in about 2008, he studied for about, I think it was 40 years, different cases of reincarnation. He was an American psychiatrist and researcher um, and well known at the University of Virginia. And he's, this is one of his more popular quotes where he says, reincarnation at least as I conceive it, does not nullify what we know about evolution and genetics. It suggests, however, that there may be two streams of evolution, the biological one and the personal one, and that during terrestrial lives, these streams may interact. Which lines... With, this, what he says here, lines up pretty well with how we understand from a spiritist perspective. But it brings us to the following reminder, which is what this chapter is about. Conscientiousness, or rather reincarnation and conscientiousness. And as a reminder, just to level set and a reminder for ourselves that self-awareness and conscientiousness are slightly different. Now, self-awareness is circumscript to ourselves, but being conscientious and being conscious, consciousness, it expands way beyond us. In this particular quote we found, while self-awareness helps us understand oneself more deeply, consciousness expands your awareness beyond your individual identity. Self-awareness invites you to dive into the depths of your being, while consciousness lifts you to soar above the limitations of the personal mind. And so this is a great segue into, as we understand conscientiousness and reincarnation, as reincarnation helps us to have this bigger perspective of life and not be so circumscribed to our, our little life, not have tunnel vision, if you will, not to be so focused on what's going on in, in my life and my struggles, not that those, not that our feelings and our are not valid, but it's a reminder for us that this life is passes so quickly from one life to the next. And that we do suffer and experience pain. But in the grand scheme of life and the lives that we live, it's small. And this can be a very comforting factor when we remember this and remind ourselves of this. So the question that it beckons us and behooves us to ask, is it good for me 
to strive for or towards being more conscientious? That is the billion dollar question. And Joanna shares in this chapter, yes, of course, she says specifically, the lucid acquisition, the lucid acquisition of conscientiousness makes room for understanding the laws that govern life. Fostering individuals' progress as they strive for their own education and therefore that of society. Our aspirations are no longer satisfied by the utopian concepts and childish, childish statements devoid of reason that used to anesthetize the discernment of the masses. So when we lift up our consciousness, when we are able to not just be self-aware, but be conscientious of the world at large, when we are able to look at the bigger picture of not just what affects me, but what affects my neighbor, my neighbor's neighbor, the neighboring city and town, the world, neighboring country, when I'm able to have a broader perspective, like the man on the mountain, I'm able to get in touch with a deeper part of not just myself, but the purpose in all of what we do. And that is something that is not just beneficial for myself, my immediate family, but it is a, it's beneficial, as Joanna says here, for society. So how is this interesting? We're watching this TV show, uh, TV show, it's, I don't even know what to call it. It's called Judge Judy. Real cases that they, they go on this show, so take it, for what, take it for what it's worth. But what's interesting, there's this case about this two fighting neighbors, two neighbors that were arguing and they were bickering back and forth. There was this case, there was a legal battle, which we won't get into, but basically one neighbor was complaining. So neighbor A, neighbor B, neighbor B or neighbor A, the plaintiff was suing neighbor B and in telling his story, he was saying how obnoxious, annoying, and considerate neighbor B is. He would play loud music at 6 a.m. in the morning. He would run his drill at five o'clock in the morning. He would do other things that were seemingly convenient for him at the time, but not thinking about the neighbors around him. So he was doing a series of all these things and you hear, you, you're watching the judge listen and she makes a comment, something to the effect of, wow, that's really inconsiderate. Not that he's not allowed to, not that from a legal standpoint, you can't do what you want in your home. But when we are, when we go to make a decision, even in the smallest of decisions, even in our own homes, if we don't stop to take into consideration those around us, that is not living conscientiously. Give you another example. We saw a, a series of videos where the theme was about rude neighbors or inconsiderate neighbors. And you can see a series of different videos that someone plays and they're, they're narrating it. And some similar, similar situation where this particular neighbor leaves trash out on his lawn and all the other neighbors are just disgusted because one, it attracts rodents and bugs. It also aesthetically looks very, it's not pleasing to the eye to look at. So we say all this and we share all this because when we wish to strive for conscientiousness, it's also something as simple as how am I living my life? Of course, in the best way possible for my own evolution, but it's also considering my neighbor. Behaving in such a way where I'm causing least harm to others as well. But we digress. Getting back to Joanna and my slides, thank you. 
we change inevitably when our consciousness, when we become more conscientious, it is a part of the mechanism. Our vision changes the same way. If you ever go on a helicopter ride and you go far above the earth's surface by the sheer nature of being lifted above the surface of the earth, you're going to see a vast amount of land and have a perspective that you wouldn't have being on the land or, or standing on the ground rather. It's the same with conscientiousness. Our perspectives broaden. And Joanna continues and re reminding us why this acquisition of conscientiousness is so beneficial for us and how powerful it can be. She says the following, the acquisition of conscientiousness promotes the understanding, promotes the understanding of the causes of life through the processes of intuition, deduction, and analysis derived from experience in relation to the factors that constitute the universe. Sometimes we can see this in mature, spiritually and emotionally mature individuals. When I read this, I think of a grandmother, perhaps, that's really wise and patient and understands and has a ability to discern and use her own intuition because of all the experiences that she's lived, that she's able to have a broader perspective. This is why folks sometimes, and of course this is not, this is not an always situation, but sometimes it is very beneficial to listen to our parents. We say that more so as we are growing up as children, and why is it that God says, honor thy father and thy mother? Well, there's something inherent in our most parents. And I'm not going to say all, because there are, of course, lots of exceptions or lots of cases, not to honoring our parents, but there are a lot of cases where there are parents that are sick, that are unwell, and subsequently do very malicious things uh, to their children that are even criminal. But we're not going to get into the exceptions. We're going to talk about as if our parents are what they are, which is older than us, have more experience. And through their experience and their understanding of, of life, they have a broader perspective. And as children growing up, although we know that we are put into families that are can be challenging because we are put back into the same families where we need to repair, redress, and fix past wrongs. So oftentimes relationships can be challenging. They can be hard to say the least. But one thing usually that is for sure is that our parents will always be the ones that love us the most. And at the end of the day, will be the ones that will walk through fire for us. So it's being able to have that type of love and perspective is something that is beautiful and should be looked at with tremendous amount of respect. But I digress. For us as individuals, because it goes back to our job as individuals, not anybody else's job, what my responsibility is before God in this awareness that becoming conscientious acquiring it will ultimately benefit all of us, helps us understand life better, helps us understand what's going on in the world, which ultimately can increase our quality of life. Oftentimes when we think about quality of life, sometimes you might think about the material aspect. I think about comfort. I think about cleanliness. I think about housing. Not often is quality of life looked at from the perspective of an emotional, spiritual perspective. But if you ask anyone that's lived long enough and experienced enough struggle, 
they will attest that it's not about the material components of your life because there are plenty of rich individuals that are that have committed suicide that are increasingly unhappy so it's not the not the not that the material is wrong and and evil it's not but being able to have a clear conscience to be happy with oneself and to have a broader perspective of life brings quality of life and what if we don't wish to acquire conscientiousness. Well, Joanna, she touches on that. She says, without conscientiousness, the mind thinks logically and believes, but does not submit. Does not submit. Emotion accepts, but fears the impositions of the statues of evolution in which reincarnation lies. Conscientiousness, on the other hand, opens the floodgates of the heart and mind to the natural acceptance of successive and inevitable lives, which promote the individual. It's good for us. So when we don't wish to ascend, when we don't wish to work on ourselves to evolve, often in the end what ends up happening is that we have, again, that tunnel vision. We're only able to see through that particular lens. I can't see anything outside of that. So I'm more inclined to suffer and be fearful because I can't see beyond what's right in front of me. But if we open up the possibilities and begin to elevate our minds and work towards becoming more conscientious, Look at the words of Joanna, opens the floodgates of our hearts and our minds. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more. But the important question to ask here, how can believing in reincarnation benefit me? Would it hurt me if I didn't believe in it? We've had these questions. Someone might say, well, I believe in a lot of the tenets of spiritism, but I can't really get behind reincarnation. Is that going to hurt me? What does spiritism say? And for those of you who are watching online, or the, the virtual or um, the recorded version of this, feel free to drop your comments in the comment section. How can reincarnation benefit me? Or would it hurt me if I didn't? believe in it. I'm going to stop there for a second. I want us to think about that. What do you think? What do you all think? Well, Kardec, in this particular book, What is Spiritism, shares a very, very interesting perspective. Of course, I recommend you can go and get this book, read it yourself. But he shares the following. One blatant and obvious thing is the fact that either reincarnation exists or it doesn't. It either exists or it doesn't. It's one or the other. Okay. But shares the following. Are those who are not orthodox in the strict sense of the word, but who do all the good they can, who are kind and indulgent toward their neighbors and honest, in their social relationship, be less assured of their salvation than those who believe in everything, but who are hard, selfish, and uncharitable? In other words, there are those who may be, there are those who are non-spiritist or non-believers or non-believers in reincarnation, but they're good people. They're good towards their neighbor. They're honest. They're kind. Why would they be any less, any less loved or destined for joy and happiness than anybody else? As opposed to, as Kardec shares, someone that believes in reincarnation, but is rude and arrogant and considerate, doesn't 
concern themselves with their neighbors or how they treat their loved ones who are hard, selfish, and uncharitable. So it's not about the belief itself. It's not about, oh, yes, I believe in reincarnation. And then all of a sudden, it's not that. But it's understanding that reincarnation is a tool for our own benefit, for our own personal growth. So this is not an opportunity for us to go out and say to others, oh, if you don't believe in reincarnation, you're not being conscientious or you're, you're not raising your consciousness or your conscientiousness. Not necessarily. Hold on. Because there, as Kardec is sharing here, there are plenty of people that are wonderful human beings, wonderful souls. So again, it's not just the belief in reincarnation, but it's all the things that come with it. That ability to look beyond ourselves it's what we it's it's what re, it is what reincarnation opens up for us that is the the difference that makes the difference and joanna reminds us reincarnation is the instrument for spiritual progress it is a tool by which we can reach our full potential and yes, she reminds us, things get hard. Things We will experience pain. She says, at times, individuals must endure expiation when their wrongs are serious, submitting to afflictions that are educational dis disciplines, whereby the duties they must fulfill are fixed deep in their conscience. So it's not that God is out there punishing us, but we deep in our own souls and our deep conscience in the hard drive of our soul, if you will, is, is stored and saved all the things that we have ever done. We may be able to ignore it for quite some time, but eventually it will come back around because we cannot push down the truth forever. She goes on to say, at other times, they undergo trials which strengthen the moral fibers responsible for dignifying action. So even through the trials that we experience, the challenges that we experience, they are opportunities for us to strengthen our own moral fibers. And how many times have we heard story after story of people experiencing hard stuff and saying after the fact, I didn't know I had the strength to endure that. Prior to that experience, I didn't know that I had that strength within me until I experienced that. And you become more morally sound and strong after a hardship. If we're able to go through it, endure it, and come out the other end. We realize how strong we really can and are as individuals to endure and how beneficial it is to us to go through that. Much like I think it's the only tangible thing I can think of at this very moment, when you are not in shape physically, and you put the time in at the gym, let's say a year or two later, and then you look at your, your physique and you look back at previous photos and you see how far you've come. There's a satisfaction in that to know that all those, those days of sweating and hard work and disciplining yourself has paid off. You know, that feeling of satisfaction, except that's in a physical sense. The sensation we can feel for a job well done, for knowing that I did my best and I did my duty, that sense of satisfaction is more fulfilling than any amount of any physical experience 
that we can have or any material thing that we can acquire. Truly, Joanna goes on, that the perspective we should have that it's reincarnation, it's not a punishment. It's a gift of rebirth and it's a blessing from God. I was listening to a probable uh, case or suspected case of reincarnation and it was a grandmother no, excuse me, it, it was, well, she was a grandmother, um, a grandmother talking about her daughter and grand, grandchild. And they had, and the, the granddaughter had, um, was it was three or four years old and was talking about, you know, a story of like her previous life and all these things. And the family was like, wow, this is crazy. They're, they weren't a family that believed in that sort of thing. But the end of the interview of this particular grandmother talking about her granddaughter, she said, you know, the most fascinating or the not most fascinating, the most um, rewarding or helpful thing that came out of this experience with my granddaughter is that she said, recently, I lost my son and other grandson in a car crash. They died fatally, very unexpected. She gets emotional in the video. And she says, you know, prior to this experience, had I lost my son and grandson without this knowledge of the possibility of reincarnation, I would have been much more devastated because my prior belief was that you die, you go poof, there's nothing. But she said, now that I feel so comforted and to me, meaning the grandmother, she said, I feel reassured in knowing that I will see my son and grandson again one day. And that brings me a little bit of comfort in my pain. So it's something beautiful to recognize that although we suffer and we go through hardship, it's still a blessing that we get to see our loved ones again. Joanna goes on to say, awareness of reincarnation will drive you to progress through love and the good with no alternative for failure. Without reincarnation, intelligent life would return to chaos and the logic of progress would be reduced to stupidity and ignorance. So how would we, how would we evolve? Would humanity evolve if the soul just, if new, soul, new souls were coming back and without any prior knowledge, we'd be perpetually stuck in the Stone Age. But you might be thinking at this point, well, there are so many cases that have been recorded, not just by Dr. Ian Stevenson. There are other researches, um, Jim, Dr. Jim Tucker and all the other research that's uh, shared. You can nowadays with Google and YouTube, there's so much, there's a plethora of stories you can go watch and listen to. Likewise, there are a ton of spiritist literature now in English. So really no excuse for us not to go on Amazon or other websites to find a lot of these spiritually uplifting books, such as the Andrea Louise collection. And we're going to discuss here in a second, a case of reincarnation, not often spoken about um, in many of our lectures. We wanted to bring this particular case that we found very interesting. And this is from chapter 12 of the book, In the Greater World. This book was psychographed by the late Francisco Candido Xavier, or known more affectionately as Chico Xavier, psychograph uh, by the spirit, Andre Louise. And in this particular book in chapter 12, they talk a little bit about the case of a grandfather and his grandson. The grandfather, whose name is Fabricio, has a grandson who also is named Fabricio Jr. or affectionately, little Fabricio. And it's very beautiful the way that they paint the relationship between grandson and grandfather. 
And in this one particular scene that's beautifully narrated in the book, and this particular grandfather is very ill. He is um, sort of losing his mind slowly but surely. And they tell in the book that he's maybe days to weeks away from, from discarnating, from dying. So this one particular day, um, the grandson comes to visit his grandson and this grandfather it loves his grandson like just is so he actually asks for him as he's he's laying down and resting he, he's asking for you know where is little fabricio so he ends up showing up in this particular part of the book in the scene and he's so elated oh and his he just lights up at the vision of his grandson and in the book i think he's like seven or eight years old and the and the grandson is so excited to see his grandfather and they embrace and they hug and they talk and but the grandfather is very disturbed emotionally because of things he had done earlier on in his life some really really we would say i think in andrea louise's terms wretched things to his siblings um, and essentially, um, he had stolen the inheritance without getting thoroughly and too deep into the story. You can go and read it for yourself, but essentially he had stolen the inheritance from his two siblings, which he had promised to his father on his deathbed that he would help his siblings after his father, after the father of grandpa Fabrizio passes away, he finds a way to steal away the inheritance and disposes of his brothers and they're destitute out there in the world and they die horrible deaths. But at this point in the story, in present day, grandpa Fabrizio is, is on his own deathbed and his little, for his little loving grandson, he asks him to pray with him and little Fabrizio does and his heart is so warmed. And then Andrea Louise, in telling some of the backstory, looking at this loving scene, shares the following. This boy, this little Fabrizio or Fabrizio Jr., this boy is Fabrizio's, Fabrizio's former father. He has returned to the family of his criminal son through the blessed gates of reincarnation. Remember, Grandpa Fabricio's father, like 50 years, 60 years prior to this, had passed away. And on his deathbed, turned to his oldest son, Fabricio, and said, please take care of your two, your, your younger siblings, because he was wealthy. He was leaving inheritance to all of them. But he told his oldest son, please manage it and watch out for your siblings. And he promised his father on his deathbed not to worry, he would take care of his younger siblings. Father passes, and he almost immediately gets all the money for himself and finds a way to legally get rid of his siblings. So he lives a very lavish life, full of amenities and luxury, while his other siblings, his younger siblings, die in impoverished conditions. And now, fast forward, it's Grandpa Fabricio. Now Fabricio is older. And he had gotten married and had kids of his own. His grandson is the reincarnation of his own father. He is his only grandson in that life. Later, he will assume control of the material inheritance of the family, the property that was his in the first place. The law never sleeps. So do we get it? She might ask, well, what, what's going to happen? What happens to his siblings who already died decades prior? Well, for one, Grandpa Fabricio did reach a point in his adult life where he tried to go back and look for his siblings and had found out their horrible fate in life that they died from tuberculosis and just died a horrible, horrible death in poverty in really horrible conditions, he could never forgive himself. So he began to become a very disturbed individual and 
in the book, they go more into detail about this, but looking at it from the re from the perspective of reincarnation, we see how beautiful and perfect God's law is. So they share in the book, well, here we have the former father reincarnates as his son's son to reinherit all his money back. And then Andrea Louise asked the mentor, well, what about the brothers of, of Grandpa Fabricio? Well, at some point, if, if allowed and if other, if there's an opportunity, those brothers will reincarnate back into the family, in the family circle somehow to regain what was stolen from them. But this right here is a beautiful reminder about reincarnation that we may try to transgress the laws of God but ultimately what is right will always be returned to what is right and that when we transgress a law of God we're not transgressing a person although people feel hurt we are ultimately transgressing laws of God that we must and we will respond to because our own conscience calls at us. And in this book, and in this particular chapter 12, you can read in detail how tormented Grandpa Fabricio was. That for years and years and decades, he was able to ignore his conscience and push down the wrong that he had done, but there came a point where he couldn't push it down anymore. And no amount of the wealth and jewels and luxury trips he took, nothing silenced that inner knowing that what he did was wrong. That's why he reached a point in his adult life where he tried to go back to make amends with his siblings. But then he finds out that they're dead and he gives up and he actually loses hope. And he, so he basically gives in to all his guilt and his remorse that he becomes very unbalanced mentally and emotionally. He develops illness in his body and subsequently in his very old age begins to quite literally lose his mind. And again, you can read more in detail about those interesting facts in chapter 12 of this book, In the Greater World. So we come to this in the Spirit's book. Question 170. Kardec asks the wise spirits, what does the spirit become after its final incarnation? Imagine reaching that, which for most of us, that'll be a gazillion lifetimes from now, perhaps, give or take. But what happens right when we are finalizing our last incarnation? What do you all think? What happens? You could put it in the chat. And for those of you who are there in person, I want you just to think about it for, let's take a, a few seconds here. You don't say it out loud, but what do you think? What does the spirit become after its final incarnation? What happens to it? Where does it go? What does it do? We live so much of our spiritual understanding now. Okay, well, I'm preparing for my next incarnation. I, I, I go through that period in the spirit realm where I'm, I'm recuperating and then I'm preparing and planning out next steps. What happens when that is you've already completed the final step? Can you imagine? I know I can't. It's hard for me to imagine being at that stage. But what do we think? Again, this is question 170 of the Spirit's book. No cheating. No one... Go on your phones and look this up. The look up the answer. 
this is for us just to think about what do we think is going to happen to us? I see Paula puts in the chat with spirit graduates to pure spirit. Sarah shares, we become a pure spirit. Hope you guys aren't cheating looking at the answer. <laughs> what does the spirit become after its final incarnation? Drum roll. The spirits respond. A blessed, pure spirit. And some say from that point on, there's a whole other scale of angelic spirits. There's a whole other scale of, not that we begin again, but it's a whole other level of growth that I think it's so challenging to even conceptualize that. But no, we become a pure spirit. It's something to look forward to. Not in the perspective that we're going to be living in the spiritual version of the Maldives, if you will. Because believe it or not, the more evolved we become, the more work we actually do. I know it sounds unfathomable. We think, oh, then I get to rest and relax. It's actually quite the contrary. And we can see this throughout the books of, of Andrea Louise and other spiritist adjunct literature, that the more evolved spirit that you are, the more work we're involved in. We're involved in. Now, be uh, comforted to know that there are rest breaks, but there is this desire to help. To love more. It's like the old uh, story of the man in the cave. When you get out of the cave, uh, it's um, I think it's Plato's allegory of the cave. You know, as the as the caveman leaves the cave and sees the light, he wants to go back to his friends still stuck in the cave, who don't believe there's anything outside of the cave. He wants to convince them, like, look, there's more to life than just this cave. Come on, come out. So that kind of, in a very simple, overly simplified way, can be the way in which we could explain in a tangible way what happens to us as we evolve. We want to help others. It becomes a strong desire to want to go back into the burning building and help those that are suffering in pain. Because we want to bring about comfort and peace to others. And Joanna, she finalizes with this last sentence, for that desired goal, the awareness of reincarnation is indispensable. The awareness of reincarnation, it's indispensable. And it is again, folks, a tool for our own betterment. It helps us to have a broader perspective on life. It's a great reminder. We know that reincarnation is a topic that is, it's a tenet in spiritism. It's a pillar. We all know about it as spiritists. We all believe in it. And you might think, why are we beating a dead horse? We all know reincarnation exists from a spiritist perspective, of course. Why talk about it? Because the simple reminder of it reminds us to get out of our tunnel vision. Sometimes we can be so, in, in different terms, siloed into what, in our own lives, you know, stuck in this one perspective that we lose touch with the reality of the bigger things in life what's really important, what, what life is really about, how short life is, really. And it's one thing that I have never forgotten in the last eight or nine years since the death of my father in this life. And at the end of his life, when he was quite literally on his deathbed, 
I will never forget the look on his face when he turns to me and says, this life has passed by so quickly. It feels like an instant has passed. He said, that's what it feels like for me. Looking back and reflecting on my life. You know, when you go through hardships and you're going through so much, it feels like an eternity. But as we reach the end of this very short life, and as we grow and mature, we begin to realize that life is short in comparison to the great successive amount of lives that we live. So let us love and be charitable. Let us be as kind as we can be. And let us make that effort to work on ourselves. Because we are worthy. We are children of God, of a most high God, of a most loving God, of a most generous God. Loving Spirit Guides. We have this fantastic modeling guide, the governor of this planet, Jesus, that loves us unconditionally. And we just passed Easter recently as well. And so we know that he came down to this earth in the physical form, if you will, simply, simply, because we were the building on fire and he was and is our eternal fireman coming in to save us from ourselves until today. Dear friends, thank you so much for listening. And for those of you on the web, we thank you so much as well. And Leo, I'll pass it over to you for a moment. I think we or I can do the final prayer. You let me know. Oh. Thank you, Kirsten, for this amazing reminder in bringing this chapter, right? Um, helping us understand this chapter. Uh, the idea of expansion, the way that Joanna D'Angelo brings, it's a completely different perspective about reincarnation that I did not have before. Um, so thank you for bringing that to us. And, and Help us think, help us um, um, put into perspective in our lives, right? It reminds, it re also reminds me of uh, a saying of Arodo uh, Dutra Dias um, when he was asked or he mentioned that if there was one thing that he could say uh, to the whole world, right, um, and is, is that we are eternal, right? And with this, this, this idea of reincarnation brings us uh, again. Um, the reminder that we are eternal, right? That we'll come back uh, to the uh, to the physical body. With your question as well, is that we'll continue on, that we will um, live on, right? So thank you for that. We do have some questions, some comments. I'll ask Daniel to put on the screen for us. And Paula asks us, love this topic. Why I am a spiritist? Thanks for addressing it so well. Please comment further on the sentence on page 132, paragraph 3. Emotion accepts but fears the impositions of the statues of. Yes, actually, well, I think I'll pull back up my, my own, uh, my slide on what she's referring to. Um, there is, uh, if I can find it, I know, I know it's on my slide. Um, well, here it is right here. Yeah. So without, without conscious, without conscientiousness, the mind thinks logically and believes, but does not submit emotion accepts, but fears the impositions of the statutes of evolution in which reincarnation lies. So I can cognitively and logically and even emotionally accept that reincarnation exists. But when I'm not living in conscientiousness, fear of what 
reincarnation could mean for me is overwhelming. Not wanting to accept, well, I might lose my wealth. I might lose my position or my status in society, or I'll lose this or that thing. When that fear overwhelms us so we can accept it, I get it. But deep within my understanding, because I'm not living in that conscientiousness, because I've not raised myself or acquired it, if you will, in Joanna's, turn, in Joanna's words, acquiring it, that fear of what is to come is overwhelming. But the opposite happens. When I'm able to acquire conscientiousness, my heart opens to the possibilities that lay ahead. Now, that's not to say that we won't have any fear whatsoever. There's always a level of fear of what is unknown that is normal, but it's that overwhelming fear that can happen when we cannot look beyond ourselves and our current circumstance or situation. Um, I hope that, I mean, that offers some clarity. This is, again, my interpretation. Always willing to take this offline and discuss this further. It's, Joanna is meant to provoke questions and the fact that it provoked this, this further questioning within Paula um, is excellent. I think jo that's what Joanna and her, her writing is supposed to do. So thank you, Paula. Oh, don't hear you, Leo. Okay. You forgive me. I I don't want to get into the study that you did, and yeah, no, one go ahead, jump in. Mind as well in. is the the fear of ceasing to exist too, right? Of our essence, of what we learn, of what we have become, uh, along with our baggage from the past, um, into the future, right? Uh, giving continuation to this, so it, it's a. Uh, I'm glad that you brought it up because it is, um, you know, a, a striking point, <laughs> if we can say that way in a good way, uh, by Joanna D'Angelo in this chapter. So yeah, that's that's great. Um, you know that she reminds us of that moment. So if we have to, if, if as we are doing our our reading our reflections, let us think about that, right? So that was great. You're on mute, Kirsten. And I think what this reminds me of, that there's a lot, from a historical perspective, there are a lot of um, things that are said about, I forget the name of the, the, the emperor or the king. Was it Constantine? I, I can't recall. But there were people in, in making different versions of the Bible say or allege that kings and powerful people in, in prominent positions took out um, writings about reincarnation that were probably possibly talked about at the time out of the Bible because they feared this very thing. They feared thinking about, well, I don't want, they don't even want to talk about reincarnation because that would mean that they, that others might look at them as, well, you're king today, but in the next life you could be a pauper. So kind of along the same lines, um, you know, there's, individuals throughout history that wanted to even burn this idea of reincarnation because looking from a social um, and a status position as well. I just wanted to bring it up because it came to my mind as well. Very well. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, Daniel? And Paul again says the best description of how reincarnation was suppressed in 300, 325 AD was in Kardec's Spiritism by Emma Bragdon, wondering why this book is in refer reference more in Spiritist talks. Well, I, 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 thank you, Paula. Yeah, I mean, this is what I was talking about. I think we were having the same mind-to-mind -mind connection here. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, I, I can't speak to, as to why that particular book isn't referenced. Maybe it is. I haven't watched every single lecture in the English language to be fully transparent. I think it has been, especially when it first came out. Um, but I think like a lot of books that are 
produced. I think some books are just forgotten about or other books are, are cited more. But I think the knowledge of that, if people do enough digging, um, because I, I knew about that, even outside of Emma Bragdon in, in that particular book, I think that anyone that researches reincarnation will come across that information, um, you know, that many, many centuries and centuries and centuries ago, um, allegedly information was removed. Uh, so reincarnation wouldn't be as prominently known as it was or suppressed, if you will. So I can't really speak to that, but the information is out there, you know, for any, anyone to go and, and look into. And I, I do know the knowledge is shared. Um, again, I think it's just like one of those things where, you know, reincarnation is a topic that it's a common, it's a tenet of spiritism. So it, maybe it's not a topic that is always talked about necessarily because there's so many things to be discussed, but thank you, Paula. Thank you, Kirsten. And as we wait to the next comment, nothing else, Daniel? Anyone here would like to? Ida Sema says, thank you, Kirsten, for this wonderful talk. And thank you for presentation and gift uh, and the gift for us. Herbert Leonardo uh, mentioned, I do have, I would like to ask a question, Kirsten. And this is more in... Of course, I would you know since you study and you were working on this on this chapter with us today, uh, there's a lot that I can't say. But in your um, um, enlightenment that you have have received with studying this chapter, uh, what would you say for for us? Um, you know, since you brought this chapter, that sometimes we get either caught up on the fact that we're here with those. Uh, that we reincarnated before, um, you know, forcibly, or those of us who are waiting, perhaps, to have that chance again, to be with those whom we have um, lived in this lifetime or in previous lifetime, the longing feelings that we have sometimes. Hmm. So, how to manage the feelings of longing, whether for the whether of those who have already passed. The longing or, for yeah, it's a longing for those who for that that we have already passed, uh, or sometimes that feeling that we have inside longing. of us that something mm -hmm. is missing, as well as sometimes the 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 feeling that we are forcibly living with one another because inside of us, for some of us spiritists, we feel that oh, this is karma or this is something that we have to go through. Well, those are um, those are Double two just. <laughs> Those are two very distinct and, and somewhat different questions. There's the question of, as I understood it, how to manage the, the feelings and emotions that we have of those who have already passed, which deals with uh, grief and the process of grief, um, which is one thing. And with that, and with this sensation that perhaps maybe we don't know where it comes from, but it's a longing for something or someone that somewhere that is perhaps might be somewhere out there in the universe, but it's a longing that we can't really explain. And I think a lot of, there've been a, a few people who have experienced this that I've spoken to, um, that it's this inner longing uh, for something, some sort of love, something that's out there that they don't currently have. And then um, simultaneously experiencing, you know, the consequences of our, our current actions in which some might call karma from a spiritist perspective, we call it action and reaction. And the problem, not the problem, sometimes we, when we look at karma or you know, when we say karma, we, we think of like predestined, well, this is just what I'm destined to be in, which isn't exactly correct. I mean, it, it is the consequences of the decisions that we have made. And as the old saying goes, you know, you made your bed, now you got to lie in it. And that's really hard. So essentially is how to manage that from an emotional, psychological, and just as a human being, how do I manage that feeling of, of I'm assuming that's what you're asking, of having to deal with the consequences of my own actions and being in a situation where it's like, well, you know that you, you've, you know, this is where you've led yourself. And there are actions people we can take 
to either get out of a situation that we feel uncomfortable. And I think I'm going to answer this question in, in a very general sense, because I, I think that this, you know, this might be very different for each person. Every circumstance is different. Every um, circumstance is very unique and um, warrants its own consideration. But I would say from the perspective of how to deal with loved ones who have already left this world and we long for them, as someone who has experienced grief personally, having lost a loved one, and my, and, well, I keep it at that, having lost a loved one, that longing and the grief process itself is, is different for everyone. And um, I would say that that longing doesn't ever fully go away. Um, it is a longing that we have. And we have to try to mitigate as best we can by loving those who are still here and by loving those around us. So for instance, after the passing, and forgive me for using this personal anecdote, but I use it just to illustrate, not to elevate my personal life at, at, by any means, because we're not special, but simply to illustrate what one can do. So after the death of, of our of our father, you, I felt that void, that longing to that father figure not being on physical earth. So I actually had a neighbor who was elderly. She actually passed away about a year ago. And I love to see her out because I love to stop and talk with her. It seemed as though she uh, primarily lived alone, but she had um, adult children that would come and visit with her. So she was where, well cared for, it, it appeared. But I love to stop and talk with her because in her I saw my own parent. In her, I found an opportunity to express that love of a child to an adult that I felt was missing. And it's something that we can do in our lives is to love those around us. And so in my mind, I had sort of emotionally adopted this neighbor. And in any time I see elderly people I have great pleasure in assisting them or helping them or interacting with them. Um, because sometimes when we look at the elderly population, sometimes people disregard them or they look at them as a nuisance or they're slow or they're annoying or what have you. But therein lies an opportunity to express love and mitigate somehow because we can't ever get rid of it, but sort of transform it, transcend that sense of longing. And the same goes for, for example, women who uh, women who commit abortion, for lack of a better way to put it. Forgive the, the frankness there. But the recommendation for them is to go either adopt, to go and volunteer their time, to help care for other uh, other children, other babies, or even women that are infertile, and have that immense longing for children is to go and experience that love by loving other children, other people's children. In that way, somehow we can mitigate some of our pain by being loving and charitable towards others. Because it is the human experience sometimes. And I see um, there's some comments Paula puts, it's bittersweet how sorrow and longing make us whole by Suzanne Caney. It's a helpful book. Thank you, Paula. Yeah, it's it's the human experience. And so that's what I'll say, Leo, because I think I don't I don't want to take up much time. We could have a whole discussion alone, probably another hour long on those questions you you presented. But thank you for that, for sharing no, that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And and no, by by all means, we um you know, sharing your personal um, um, anecdote and life story does give us the, the the incentive, at least, to continue on and and do what you're saying. Love one another, right? Go ahead. And I will add one last thing. As a society, as, as human beings, 
we are prone to want to repress, suppress, drug away. Not, not that medication is wrong. It's absolutely not. We need medication in varied forms and shapes. But I mean, in, in, a, in a bad way, drug away our feelings because we are fearful. We don't want to feel pain, especially emotional pain. So physical pain is one thing, but emotional pain is something that we try to run from like as if it were an alligator chomping us at the bit, you know, and just run as far away as possible as we can from it. When one thing I really want to stress and advise others, and this comes from personal experience, is to lean into your own emotions. If we are experiencing difficult emotions, much like reincarnation, that's a tool, our emotions are a gauge and a guide to our own souls to not run away from ourselves because we can't, it's an illusion. We cannot run away from ourselves. But I would say lean into that longing and ask yourself, what can that teach you in that moment? So just a thought. Thank you. Yes, it's it, there are different painkillers, right? When it comes down to physical pain and the 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 pain of the heart, right? And usually the pain of the heart, we tend to do more crazy things <laughs> to put yeah. it aside. So thank you for that that great um, reminder as well. And Orlando says thank you for all your wisdom and knowledge you share with us. So great. Um, now she's being. <laughs> Orlando's my friend. Hi, Orlando using the, uh, I don't know if you can see you just to. I did, I saw the hearts. Yes, I, it's something that WebEx or Zoom, StreamYard, I they, they do this now. So now you have to put it in front of your face actually, as Daniel was saying. Okay, there. yeah, All that's right. super cool. You can do the, the <laughs> thumbs, up too. thumbs up as well. That's super as cool. Well. The technology for us, right? What a great time to Amazing. live. We can play with these things and make our, our time more interactive. So. With, um, uh, with not having any questions, any more comments, I, we would like to thank you again. All this hard work of the 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 study and the presentation of this book, this chap chapter, um, and staying steadfast on it, uh, so we can learn with uh, you and learn with Joanna D'Angelo as well. So, with that, I would like to ask you for um, to say our visualization and final prayer as well. And thank you. Absolutely. With that, dear friends. We thank God for these moments together. We thank our spirit benefactors. We thank all those who are there physically and person, connecting with us also virtually. And for all of this effort put into communing together in remembrance of the purpose of our lives connecting with this great creator, the source of all things. Let us together in our minds connect with these thoughts, these words, imagining ourselves together in a place we feel most at ease, most at peace, and most loved. We feel a lightness in our heart while simultaneously feeling deeply connected to our Creator. Allow this bright light fall over us in a way to cleanse us, to bring us healing, to regenerate from our soul to ourselves, to bring back to balance 
every microscopic part of us on every level as we remember the times when people gathered risking their lives to pray to speak of Jesus to speak of a singular God but now we have this freedom to speak openly to come together freely praising and being grateful let us receive this embrace from our spirit benefactors our spirit guides reminding us that we are loved that we are children of God that we have purpose and that joy and happiness are at our own fingertips Let us sit in this moment of communion of bliss. With a grateful heart, we thank you. We thank you, God, spirit benefactors, and our master, Jesus. And so be it. And now we will go on to our passive session.